American shuttle disaster and of Reagan's address to his people this evening. Plus, experts from Britain and the States try to piece together exactly what happened. And now, Arena takes a journey with a man whose books have been recently rediscovered, one of Britain's most original travel writers, Norman Lewis, the journeyman. I'm probably one of the few people, uh, or certainly that I know, that can actually enter a room and leave it without, and, and nobody will know that I've been there. I can just come in completely silently. I can turn the handle of the door, I can let myself in. I can sum up the situation and retreat, and nobody will know that I've been there. This is a, an acquired knack that I've never lost. I just kept out of the way, behaved myself, kept quiet. In that way, deflected wrath as, as much as I possibly could. I've probably gone through life to some extent expecting to be sort of hit over the head all the time. It's never happened, but I've worried about it. There's a possibility. Norman Lewis, now in his 70s, is one of the outstanding travel writers of his generation. In his book, Naples 44, he wrote about his adventures in southern Italy at the end of the war. Voices of the Old Sea describes a remote fishing village in northeast Spain. Golden Earth took him to another remote and withdrawn country, Burma. A Dragon Apparent, his book on Indochina before the Vietnam War, and The Honoured Society, a history of the Mafia in Sicily, were both bestsellers in their day. He's also an investigative journalist who's made journeys all over South and Central America, focusing world attention on the destruction of the Indians. Don McCullen, the photographer, often travels and works with him. A man like Norman, you know, you wouldn't imagine a man like him. You'd see him on a train where he commutes on the odd occasion to London to do things, cultural things, or to see members of his family and so on. And if you sat opposite this man on the train, you wouldn't dream in a million years what this man has achieved in his life. It, and he's achieved it by not being loud, aggressive. He's done it by quietly going there and doing it. And he said to me once when I'd been away, been away? And I said, yes, I've been to the Red Sea. I said, but he said, where, where was it? I said, I don't think you'd know it, Norman. It was a place called Suakim where Gordon landed prior to his, his battle at Omdurman. And he said, Oh, Sue Arkin, he said, I once did a book in 1935 about Arab Dowds, but he was actually there the year I was born. So Norman's been around an awful long time, and he's done more than most of us. This volcanic crater is about six miles north of Naples. It's the kind of unexpected and deserted place that Norman Lewis has the knack of finding. Besides his ability to fade into the background, he has the qualities you'd expect in the writer of travel books, a fascination with customs and superstitions, a sense of history, and an eye for the smaller details of life.
but his books are more than straight reportage or travel journals. And Lewis himself is rather different from his polite and apparently deadpan exterior. He seems almost to attract the unexpected, the bizarre, and there's a peculiar Norman Lewis way of looking at things. It's his published war diary that has all the Lewis trademarks. Naples 44 was written in spite of a friend's admonition, at least spare us your war memoirs. That's something nobody wants to hear any more about. This is Naples, the capital of the former kingdom of Naples. One of the most beautiful of Mediterranean cities. Modern war is cruel to any city. It has been cruel to Naples. Long before the battle for the city itself, right from the days of Alamein and Marath, Allied bombers hammered military objectives in Naples with devastating effect. They bombed the harbor until the quays were a shambles and the roadstead was choked with sunken ships. In September 1943, I came ashore on the beach at Pestum, 10 miles south of Salerno. Very cautiously, because we hadn't the faintest idea where the Germans were, we scrambled through the woods and then came out into the open. There, to our intense astonishment, we were confronted by these marvellous temples and the shock, the aesthetic shock was quite extraordinary. It was very exciting. September the 10th, a warm, calm morning. We set out to explore a little of our immediate environment and were admiring the splendid husk of the Temple of Neptune when the war came to us in the shape of a single attacking plane. Hearing its approach, we crouched under a lintel. The plane swooped, opened up with its machine guns, and then passed on to drop a single bomb on the beach before heading off northwards. One of my friends felt a light tap on a pack he was wearing, caused by a spent machine gun bullet, which fell harmlessly to the ground. The experience was, on the whole, an exhilarating one. We appreciated the contrasts involved, and no one experienced alarm. Well, as soon as I got to Naples, I went to Casella's bookshop, and I bought an excellent print showing this temple and showing a splendid collection of buffaloes wandering around in the neighborhood. September the 18th. I saw a number of German tanks which had been put out of action by the naval shelling. Several of these lay near or in tremendous craters. In one case, the trapped crew had been broiled in such a way that a puddle of fat had spread from under the tank, and this was quilted with brilliant flies of all descriptions and colors. Possibly because I was an only child, possibly because I was extremely lonely, it was a great consolation to write about things and uh, it, to make them, to, to solidify them in my imagination, to assist me to, 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 to remember the pleasant experiences I'd had. And I think that's really how I became almost addicted to writing. The first attempts to write were really a matter of um, entering in all the literary competitions I could find in such papers as Answers and various other sort of very unimportant literary papers of the day, John, John of London's Weekly and so on. And uh, I probably entered in many hundreds of these and I never in any circumstances collected a first prize. I don't even remember a second or a third, but I had numerous uh, compensation prizes, which amounted in those days to five shillings each. I had the kind of education of the child. I went to a Church of England school in which they uh, imbued resignation. You were treated like an Arab child. You were told that there were certain things you had to expect in life and certain things you couldn't expect, the rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate, and so on, you see. And uh, therefore, um, I, was, I was 
susceptible to that kind of propaganda, just as anybody is susceptible to any kind of propaganda if it is delivered over a long enough period. So you can regard me, roughly speaking, as not a very ambitious person, uh, basically a resigned person. It was my grandfather's ambition to make a Welshman of me. He was one of Carmarthen's leading citizens with a fortune based on a cargo of ruined tea he'd salvaged from a ship sunk in Swansea Harbour. I would spend some holidays in Llanstefan at the mouth of the River Towy. Llanstefan, seven miles from Carmarthen, always struck me, even as a child, as being an extremely beautiful place. It was very deserted. It had fantastic beaches. Uh, it was full of wildlife, and uh, as a child, I could run around on the sand and pick up all the shells and chase all the crabs I wanted. The people that went down there, uh, they kept very much to themselves, and they hated to be disturbed. And uh, if I ran about on the beach and shouted, uh, too loudly, somebody would rush out and wave a stick at me or something like that. On Sunday, the miners used to get away from the hellish villages, uh, which they lived around the mines, and take the train to Ferryside, which was opposite Land Stephen, and take the ferry across and disport themselves on uh, Land Stephen Beach. And this, of course, used to infuriate the local people, all of whom were, were rigid, fanatical Sabbatarians. That is to say, to the, the stage when one could not whistle or sing on a Sabbath day or read anything but holy books. So uh, there was a tremendous concerted effort to drive the miners away by being as unpleasant to them as they possibly could. I recall one occasion when a party of miners enjoying themselves in every possible way on the beach finally were stoned and they withstood this uh, terrible treatment for a certain amount of time in the most dignified fashion. Uh, and then in the end, seeing that uh, it wasn't going to get any better, they finally withdrew and went back to the rather terrible village from which they'd originally come. I think that I was psychologically conditioned not to feel I led a free life in England. I mean, I'd gone through such unfree conditions as a child that I think I had to get out of England in order to be able to breathe. That's what it really amounts to. For example, I've been an asthmatic all my life, but as soon as I go away on a holiday, the very day I go away, I don't have asthma anymore. very shortly after Naples had been smashed to pieces in two tremendous air raids. And when I arrived, what struck me first of all was the absolute silence. People were walking around and not speaking at all. And when you spoke to anyone, they didn't reply. They were quite stunned. Now, in the outskirts of the town, they were all digging in the public gardens for roots. There was no food, uh, no water, and no electricity. And uh, on those rocks that you see all along the shore, they were prying off the limpets to, to cook up, boil up. And they were also making what I imagine to be a full doomed attempt to distill water from the sea. Lots of people were doing this with the weirdest looking apparatus. I was forced every day to produce at the end of the day what was called in our particular section a log. And this meant going through the notes which I had made daily, which could be in a very chaotic form, and writing or typing those out in a legible, legible form for the daily report, which was read at, at a meeting held next morning. But these are my original notes. Uh, uh, and reading back, I often, uh, I, I can't really re remember what they were all about. Uh, they're very, very disjointed. Uh, and uh, uh, every conceivable kind of thing used to happen in one day's work. I mean, it might be 
a, a chase after a spy who almost always non-existent, or there might be a sort of a mysterious trip across to Capri, or I might have to go and see some girl and decide whether she was a satisfactory mate for an Allied officer. These things that simply happen all the time, or there'd be odd explosions around the town, or there'd be uh, soldiers would be attacked by, uh, by civilians or vice versa. October the 4th. Somewhere a few miles short of Naples proper, soldiers, each of them carrying a tin of rations, were streaming into the municipal building. I followed them and found myself in a vast room crowded with jostling soldiery. Here, a row of ladies sat at intervals of about a yard with their backs to the wall. By the side of each woman stood a small pile of tins, and it soon became clear that it was possible to make love to any one of them in this very public place by adding another tin to the pile. The women kept absolutely still. They said nothing, and their faces were as empty of expression as graven images. E io il papà non c'era, stavo in guerra, boom, 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 boom. Bum, bum, bum. E giù a ricovere, boom, 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 ho capito? People would come out of their houses seeing a, an Allied soldier standing around and asking him to come in and have a cup of coffee or a piece of bread and cheese or something like that, out of the, out of the natural goodness of their hearts. And because Neapolitans are a very, very friendly people. Uh, then, of course, the, the, the soldier would produce, uh, in, in a particular case, I'm thinking of a cutting. Uh, from the, uh, the military newspaper, which suggested that he should show this written in Italian to whoever it was he thought was accosting him, uh, often written in the most offensive terms. For example, fate attenzione, which means now look out. He said, I have no interest for your syphilitic friends, nor for your sister. Now, I love this bit. The, the Allied troops are in Italy not to admire Vesuvius or to contract maladies. No, we are here to win the war and to render Italy free again. Why don't you aid us? October the 28th. Neapolitans take their sex lives very seriously indeed. A woman called Lola asked if I could help her. It turned out that she'd taken a lover who was a captain of the RESC but as he speaks no single word of Italian, communication can only be carried on by signs, and this gives rise to a misunderstanding. Would I agree to interpret for them and settle certain basic matters? She'd made him understand by gestures one could only shudderingly imagine that her late husband, although half starved, and even when in the early stages of tuberculosis from which he died, never failed to have intercourse with her less than six times a night. She also had a habit which terrified Captain Fraser of keeping an eye on the bedside clock while he performed. I recommended him to drink, as the locals did, masala with the yolks of eggs stirred into it, and to wear a medal of San Rocco, patron of Coitus Reservatus, which could be had in any religious supply shop. I think I had an abnormal uh, quota of curiosity from my earliest childhood, I always liked to be on the move. I always liked to see new scenes. I was very, very curious, and I probably had quite a sense of adventure too. So whenever I heard there was a possibility to travel anywhere, it didn't really matter where it was as long as it was travelling, and I went if I could. Your father was a chemist, wasn't he? Yes, I think he wanted to be an artist. Uh, and uh, he was a, a rather unworldly sort of man. He wasn't really, really in touch with reality. And somehow or other, he managed to become a qualified chemist, I imagine, with some difficulty. And uh, having very little money, um, uh, he eventually set up in a chemist shop in Enfield, which I imagine he took because the rents would probably be the lowest in the London area. It was an extremely seedy place. I think he was discouraged at finding himself in business at all. 
My father's attitude towards practically all the proprietary medicines and advertised drugs he was forced to sell to pay the rent was one of bitter disillusionment, and he insisted that at best they were ineffective and at worst noxious. When someone brought a prescription to him to be dispensed, he would skip through the dog Latin, nod, laugh his scorn, and then send the customer away, advising him not to allow himself to be poisoned. Uh, he was famous locally for his manufacture of uh, an elixir, um, which uh, many hundreds of people in Enfield swore by. And I think this was largely uh, a confection of uh, garlic and water, uh, which he sold very cheaply, uh, and it was said to work miraculous cures. And as faith really is what matters, uh, they probably did. March the 19th. Today, Vesuvius erupted. It was the most majestic and terrible sight I have ever seen or ever expect to see. The smoke from the crater slowly built up into a great bulging shape having all the appearance of solidity. It swelled and expanded so slowly that there was no sign of movement in the cloud which by evening must have risen 30 or 40,000 feet into the sky and measured many miles across. At the time of my arrival in San Sebastiano, the lava was pushing its way very quietly down the main street. About 50 yards from the edge of this great, slowly shifting slag heap, the crowd of several hundred people, mostly in black, knelt in prayer. Holy banners and church images were held aloft, and acolytes swung censers and sprinkled holy water in the direction of the cinders. Occasionally, a grief-crazed citizen would grab one of the banners and dash towards the wall of lava, shaking it angrily, as if to warn off the malignant spirits of the eruption. In this church here, San Pasquale, we have one of the most beloved of all Neapolitan saints and one of the most powerful, the Blessed Egidio. One thing he did which endeared him all the more to Neapolitans was to raise from the dead a cow which had been stolen by a local butcher and cut up. The saint prayed over the dismembered portions of the cow for 15 minutes or so, sweating profusely. Catherine was the cow's name, and at the end of that time he said, Catherine, I command you to rise, and Catherine got up, lowed, and walked away. When I was in my early teens, both my parents became ardent spiritualists. The church that they founded in their back garden on the proceeds of my father's elixir continues to thrive in Enfield. people that joined my, my father and mother's circle, uh, if I went over them in my memory, I'm sure I, I would find that all of them had a, had a, a sort of background of uh, bereavement. You see, this was not so very long after the, the, the First World War, uh, in which practically every family had lost a member or somebody quite close to them. I found that the people that came to, to, uh, to, to, to take the consolation from my parents were people in, the, in this category, as in fact my parents were themselves, having lost three children out of four. There's a John here in the spirit world, and as I feel him, you know, I get a very uh, happy man, and I feel he used to hang on to his coat, um, here, his waistcoat. Yes. As he comes, uh, will you tell her you were not mistaken three days ago when you felt someone around you? You understand, um, because he's saying to me, she turned round, 
expecting to see somebody behind yes. her and there was no one there. Uh, Joan is saying, tell her it was me. And the music that she heard, yes. the music that she yes. heard was also, I presented the music to her. Uh, you've been very down, he said just recently. Yes. And I, I feel been. this is health. Yes, tired. I have had a bad, yes, tired, bad tired listless. Yes. We bring the music, you know, there's a great deal of mus uh, vibrations in music. Yes. And we have brought this to lift these vibrations to make her feel a lot better than she has been feeling. Previously, when my brother had been alive, um, my brother used to play a lot of classical music and play it very well too. And uh, uh, my father used to go around the house uh, humming Bach. But uh, with the advent of spiritualism, um, they had to go back to hymns, uh, many of which uh, seemed to me, uh, musically speaking, unsatisfactory. Um, George. I'm hearing the name George. That's his brother. Well, George is with him, <coughs> you see, in the okay. spirit world. We are both here, and he's saying George passed near a birthday. This all seems very tame stuff compared with my father's seances. He was a trance medium and he used to fall about as if seized by a fit and speak in strange voices. I was irresistibly reminded of his performances one day at the cinema when I saw a medium in action in an old Japanese film called Rashomon. Um, I have no religious faith of any kind, um, far from it, and I haven't had one since I was a child. Um, uh, 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 I was force-fed with Christianity, and a particularly fundamental form of it, uh, as found in Wales. Or I have evolved some kind of a way of life, but it's not a, not a coherent philosophy. It's, it's really a, a thing which calls for almost a day-to-day -day adjustment. October the 24th, a visit to the civilian prison of Poggio Reale. A man appeared carrying an enormous bunch of keys to walk with me to the inner gate. The man made some comment in Neapolitan dialect, which I didn't understand, and then burst out laughing. He gave me the impression of being insane. When we got to the gate, he turned his back to it, and then, still giggling and chatting incomprehensibly, his hands behind his back, selected the right key on the bunch purely by touch, thrust it unerringly into the lock and turned it. This was evidently a macabre piece of expertise to which all visitors such as myself were treated. There's a criminal trial here, the biggest ever held, of some 650 members of the Camorra, a secret criminal society which is the Naples equivalent of the Sicilian Mafia. What comes as a surprise is this massive hall which reminds me a bit of a session of the United Nations combined with an up-to-date zoo. I had a rather ringside view of the Mafia operation in southern Italy. The Sicilian invasion was very largely assisted by Mafia intervention. This was arranged in the United States by the co-chief of the Mafia, Lucky Luciano, at that time in prison there. The other co-chief of the Mafia was Vito Genovese, who was to become advisor to the Allied military government. You could say that Vito Genovese practically ran southern Italy. Um, he, uh, the mayors, which were then appointed by the Allied uh, forces, were the names were supplied by Vito Genovese. And all of them were, in the case of Sicily, ex-mafia, or in the case of the southern Italy, Camoristi. Now, it was very interesting to watch this process happening, uh, and um, 
I, when uh, when the war was over and when I had the opportunity to do so, I made some further investigations. And in this being slightly aided, possibly, uh, because I had certain Sicilian uh, connections of my own, uh, and therefore could see people in Sicily and who could help me round. These, 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 these men are just animals. Some of them are extremely abusive. Uh, you know, they are they people dazed and browbeaten. Uh, and notice the way they're sort of pacing up and down, as if they, they're a fearful scream like an, like an ape. Uh, pacing up and down to get extra exercise. There's a distraught woman down here. She looks she's absolutely wild out of her mind. Uh, just imagine a woman in the Camorra. Look at that face. The man next to her holding her hand through the bars. Uh, the wild, sort of distant expression in the eyes. This man here with his hands through the, the, the bars is extremely angry and well. shouted terms of abuse at me. Uh, I expect, you know, I expect they're probably kept in something like close confinement and solitary confinement. And even the, to get out here and walk around and look at the public is, is a bit of an excitement, a bit of a change. <laughs> Ho perso il conto. Sono otto anni e mezzo. Otto anni e mezzo. A dentro? Sì. Perché? E... Per quale reato? Sì. Tutto il codice vanno tirato a presto. Eh. Cioè, sì. Anche omicidio, se questo. Sì, sì. Sono sposato? No. no. Eh... <laughs> Allora diciamo a me che terra che ci sposiamo. <ride> no, eh, ci sposeremo. Um, I married, I married a Sicilian wife. Uh, and uh, I lived uh, in Bloomsbury off and on uh, in their family for several years. We, we, we all knew each other very well. I, I was accepted as a son of the family. They were extremely kind to me. I liked them very much. So I had a little experience of the Mafia in action in southern Italy. And um, I, I really had some inkling into the uh, workings of the Sicilian mind in England. And those, t those two factors in combination really sort of drove me to write a book on the subject. <laughs> Twelve of us NCOs plus an officer have to deal with the security problems of Naples while the delayed action bombs left by the Germans are still exploding all over the city. Never before in the short history of the Corps had one of its sections been confronted with an emergency of this order. This was chaos, babel, anarchy, the streaming of a million distraught human ants in their shattered nest. I took a day off in 1944 from the misery and the chaos of Naples, bought a jeep, came out here, and found this place as deserted and unvisited then as it appears to be now. The road passed within yards of the cliff cavern of the Sibyl, visited for counsel in their hour of extremity by so many emperors and kings of the Mediterranean world. Virgil speaks of its hundred entrances and as many issues, when sound in many voices the oracles of the prophetess. Standing there at the mouth of this tremendous chambered corridor, cut deep into the rock, it was entirely possible to believe this. Down through the openings in the cliffs, their faces pitted with innumerable caves and sanctuaries, lay the ruins of the most ancient of the Greek colonies in Italy. Here the spell remained, 
and here the sense of the grandeur of the past was overwhelming. The cabin itself seems to me to be a pretty remarkable piece of ancient engineering built presumably in about 1000 BC. And what I would say is that it's made a greater impact on my imagination than any other place in the world. And I find it extraordinary to think that the kings and emperors of the East used to come here to consult the oracle of the Kumai Sibyl. And that this grey-haired, fiery-eyed, half demented old woman was sitting here in this cabin a few yards from where we're sitting talking to each other now. And she could hold our hands the destiny of nations. It's 110 yards long. And what is more extraordinary is that roughly parallel with it, at a lower depth, is yet another passage, three quarters of a mile in length, very similar to this. And this passage goes all the way to the lake of Avanu, uh, which is considered in those days the entrance to hell. And it was along this passage that the Sibyl conducted Enias on his way to the underworld. What a wonderful view. That used to be the first Greek settlement in Italy, found in about 700 BC. Fantastic. Ah, oh, fennel. Fennel. Well, I know a marvellous recipe for this. I got it in Sicily. Broad beans, peas, a little onion, and a little fennel, not too much. Take that back with me. I've collected exotic plants and brought them here from all parts of the world and persuaded them to adapt themselves to this unfavourable environment. They never seem to be in bloom and I want to show them off. Over there, we have slipper orchids. In the wild at the present moment, as far as I know, there's only one single plant growing somewhere in Yorkshire uh, and there's a, a night and day uh, watch kept on it with guard dogs and so on. Here, once again, this is an extremely rare colchicum from Corsica. Well, and I've put any amount of ordinary colchicums around the garden the sparrows pay no attention to, but they would rip that to pieces in a matter of minutes if I left it uncovered. It's a tragic state of affairs. And this is the famous Bowles Black Viola. I owe a lot to the man who gave his name to this little plant. E. A. Bowles lived in a large house on a country estate just up the road from the bleak suburbs of Enfield. He was the greatest gentleman gardener of his age, an enormously energetic man, continually scurrying about the surface of the globe in search of new plants to add to the great collection in his garden. Of course, as schoolboys, we had no idea what a distinguished botanist he was nor do we appreciate that he was what was called in those days a confirmed bachelor. I believe he must have communicated to me many enthusiasms. I didn't realise this at the time, but later they may well have turned up in such ways as a keen amateur interest in bird watching. Uh, and in fact, I even became a bit of a plant collector myself. We could come up here whenever we liked, uh, and in those days, the new river ran through the garden. Uh, there were a lot of fish in it, and we could come in there, borrow a rod, and fish as long as we liked. And as a matter of fact, he was extremely tolerant because the boys used to run like buffaloes backwards and forwards across his flower beds uh, without his becoming particularly angry with them. He warned us that his staff, and in particular the butler, whom he greatly feared, uh, did not wish to see us admitted by the front door. But we were always welcome to come round and whistle under the, the wind of his study. Um, I would not regard uh, Mr. Bowles as having been an orthodox Christian, because when I asked him one day, Sir, do you believe in the reality of the life hereafter? 
he turned to me very surprised and said, Norman, I wish I could. Nevertheless, he was a pillar of the church. He read the lessons every Sunday, uh, and he was uh, always giving us, whenever he could, slip in a bit of moral instruction here and tell us how to conduct our lives. He used to ask us to attend his uh, confirmation classes. I think there were 10 in all, uh, which as far as I know, everybody did. Uh, the reason being that although the first nine were almost indescribably boring, uh, there was a prize as far as uh, we were concerned which awaited us all uh, at the, on the occasion of the tenth class, which was devoted to sex. Mr Bowles always went under the assumption that the, the person to be instructed knows nothing whatever of the subject, and he used to uh, go in for the most literal uh, descriptions of what took place. I mean, what was extraordinary, we, we couldn't control our laughter. I actually saw boys roll on, on, on the ground and sort of grasp their stomachs. They, they found it all so terribly funny. Uh, and uh, part of the scheme of things there, we were warned in advance by people who had attended the previous year's classes, uh, that uh, if uh, we pretended uh, ignorance and persisted in our ignorance, that Mr Bowles could be induced sometimes to show us uh, 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 really how the mechanics of sex wor worked uh, by two mannequins that he kept in his cupboard uh, underneath his collection of bird's eggs. Uh, so what one had to do was uh, say, well, look, sir, sir, uh, Jack just can't understand what you're talking about. Would you show him your jigger jig, sir? So Mr Bowles then would sometimes unlock lock his cupboard and take out uh, what appeared to be probably two ancient French dolls uh, which were operated, male and female, which were operated by uh, an ancient small steam engine which I think worked by cotton wool impregnated in spirits and then set light to. And uh, he would light this thing up and after uh, an interval of a few seconds this cover would, would get slowly into motion and gradually the motion would come faster and faster and faster then finally there would be a squeak of a siren and the thing would be over. And that really was what we went for and uh, we went home full of joy at having had this experience. October the 23rd, a tremendous scare this morning following information given by a captured enemy agent that thousands of delayed action mines would explode when the city's electricity supply was switched on. An order was given for the whole of Naples to be evacuated. Within minutes, army vehicles were tearing up and down the streets, broadcasting instructions to the civilian population. The scene as the great exodus started and a million and a half people left their houses and crowded into the streets was like some biblical calamity. Our activities have been hampered and even frustrated by false alarms and scares of every conceivable kind, all of which encouraged the growth of disbelief, so that when a few days ago reports began to come in about mysterious knocking sounds coming from the depths of the earth, we were unimpressed. It was the police's theory, supported by much rumour and some credible evidence, that a picked squad of German SS had volunteered to remain behind after the German retreat from Naples, and that they had hidden in the catacombs, from which they might, at any time, make a surprise sortie. You had these uh, rollicking soldiers rushing about the place and shining extremely powerful lights and shouting down these holes in the ground and running up these alleyways and uh, almost succeeding in losing themselves. And then you had, you could retire into the corner of a basilica, which probably remained untouched for a thousand years. And there, there were the bones in there and the niches of many hundreds and possibly thousands of persons. A few days later, there were no further complaints of knockings at all. So it was to be assumed that the Germans had died of starvation or, of course, that they'd been aided to escape, possibly by the monks who'd been so angry to see us there. When the Allied authorities were ready to turn on the power, they ordered the people out of the city. For this was the moment of greatest danger from Nazi time bombs and booby traps.
between journeyings, I live in the deep calm of Essex with my wife, who is Australian, and a son and two daughters. In addition to travel books, I've written a number of novels. One became a bestseller in Russia for no apparent ideological reason, and it sold six million copies in paperback. But all my writing stems from my addiction to travel. It has become an almost indispensable stimulant. I think that would be enough of the, the uh, parsley. Salt before we forget it. Salt, salt, salt. Um, in, in a single case, when I wrote a book about this country, it didn't get very well, well reviewed, and I don't think it was a very good book. And for some reason, I think I've got in the habit of writing uh, books set in uh, fairly exotic environments uh, and having had success for some of them, and failure really, but the only one I've written about this country, it seems to me a, a matter of prudence uh, to stick to this particular cobbler's last. My father, poor father did this for 30 years in this particular thing. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't grinding this up though. That's right. There you go. Is that enough? Yeah, good again, yeah. Well, what a nice jug, a Spanish jug for the equivalent of about 15p about 10 years ago. Imagine what you'd pay for this if you could find it. I don't, now I remember the fact that, of course, we're down to plastic buckets. <laughs> I'd always wanted to travel in the Far East. So when the frontiers of China were closed in 1950, after the communist takeover, I rapidly set off for Indochina whilst it was still possible to get in. I travelled for three months through Laos, Cambodia and South Vietnam. The Moyers weren't wholly understood by the few Europeans that came into contact with them. Mistakes were sometimes made. For example, the administrator that took me into the village I'm thinking about came on a very, very fine horse. He was a good horseman and he loved this horse. Now, the first thing he did when he got in the village was to tie it up to a sacrificial post. And, of course, the horse was immediately sacrificed, and the Moyes thanked him very much. And he knew that if he'd have tempted at that point, having donated his horse to their, to, to their spirits, that if he'd have attempted a rescue, first of all, he, at least he would have lost their confidence, the village would have been in revolt. But there was a very strong possibility that they would have shot him on the spot with their, with their crossbows. You had a whole tribe which could, could have possibly been a matter of sort of five or six hundred people, or a whole village living in one enormous long house which seemed to go on forever. Uh, and in order to, to, to keep this, this long house well organised, they had a, a, quite a stern uh, uh, disciplinary system with a man that was the equivalent of a sergeant major going up and down the various, the long house might be divided into 50 or 60 compartments. And the Moy Sergeant Major would go up and down this several times a day and he'd check that every item of personal belonging was in its, exactly in its right place. So that if you actually walked down the long house and looked into the various compartments, they all looked exactly the same. These people's worldly goods consisted of gongs. They, were, they paid enormous prices for these gongs and they treasured them because if you struck the gong in a certain way, you immediately called up the ancestral spirits. But they had all this impediment of the, these personal possessions, which might be contained in a room the size of this conservatory, and it was essential they had learned for everything to be in its place. The people themselves, like all these so-called primitive people, were in, absolutely delightful. They had uh, what I would call very, very sophisticated manners. They were very, very charming and thoughtful and kind in every way. Drinking for them was a ritual too. That was a complete ritual, and it was essential to get drunk. Um, when we went into this particular village, the, uh, the, uh, leading, the leading man, the, the enchanter, the chief, came forward and said in a very, very grave fashion bow and said, Nam Lu, which means, let us get drunk together. And they had a method, method of testing and watching you to see that you did get drunk. Everybody got drunk. First of all, the men, the men got drunk. Uh, then the old ladies, who were extremely powerful, got drunk. Then the childbearing women got drunk. Then I think the young men got drunk. I think down to the age of about 14, the whole village was absolutely stunned out of their wits, reeling about all over the place. 
In 1968 and through the 70s, I made a number of trips to Brazil, Paraguay and Venezuela to report on the fate of the South American Indians. I went with a photographer, Don McCullen. I think there's some proverb about some crow with a piece of cheese in its mouth and the fox wants that cheese and he says to the crow, I've heard you've got a lovely voice. And of course the crow started singing and dropped the cheese and off the fox went. You know, I'm not saying Norman's that, but he's certainly um, a man who knows how to charm out of the trees the very things he went for. And he's not going to do a, an 8,000 mile journey, Norman, for nothing. Norman's very passionate about one subject more than any other. Um, he's very interested in, in, in tribes of people, Indians, I mean, and, uh, in, and he likes them to live their lives in tropical forest and, and not be made to wear, you know, football shorts and become beggars, which they eventually do. And uh, we, we've done a couple of stories um, concerning um, missionaries who have been, you know, changing the lives of these people, not always for the best. In 1968, the world was shocked by a report that the Indians of Brazil were being exterminated. Now, the reason they were being exterminated was a quite a simple one, and that was that the people, people wanted the land they were living on to turn into profitable ranches. Uh, and this was being done in a quite publicised and cold-blooded fashion. That is to say, in the leading uh, Brazilian newspapers, there were uh, advertisements offering land for sale. And if you bought land which was uncleared, which means Indians were or probably were still on it, it might be as low as a dollar an acre. And if it were cleared land, which means the Indians had been exterminated, it was maybe $10 an acre or even $20 an acre. Now, this, this ex work of extermination was done by the, the most fearful and brutal uh, methods. Uh, for example, uh, the Indians were, uh, that were squatting all on their own territory were issued uh, with clothing which impregnated with, with the germs of various lethal diseases. Um, they, were, they had uh, sweets dropped, uh, uh, with, containing arsenic dropped on their villages from the air. Uh, they machine gun and bomb from the air, they were attacked with napalm. And perhaps most fearful of all, expeditions were sent overland uh, to kill them off, which uh, these were normally sort of manned by uh, psychopaths, and these, uh, these exterminations took place in circumstances of the most fearful cru cruelty. Uh, I went there for the Sunday Times uh, towards the end of this uh, process of extermination, uh, and uh, travelled around as, as best I could, although I was not made welcome by the Brazilian authorities. And eventually the, the, the Sunday Times magazine published an enormous article drawing attention to this, uh, and the, as a result, uh, a number of societies, uh, such as Survival International, were founded in the hope of bringing this state of affairs to an end. But the thing that infuriated me most of all, and I feel very, very indignant about this state of affairs, in this particular case, case um, I went with Donald McConnell, photographer, to Paraguay, and we had heard that the, uh, the New Tribes mission there were actually engaged in hunting Indians in the jungle, uh, capturing, capturing with the aid of the Paraguayan troops, and bringing them into their compound, uh, where they were subsequently sold to local colonists as slave labour. We expected to find that the missionaries there were, were collaborating with the government forces in clearing the Paraguayan jungle uh, because we had had reports of this. And that is, of course, what we found. But the situation uh, struck me as even more terrible than I expected it to be because uh, in this particular example, we were told that the, these Indians, which had obviously been brought in from the forest, we were told there was nobody in this particular hut, and Donald and I went, went in there, and we were followed by the missionary's young son, uh, who quite calmly said, oh, that one was brought in a few days, and she was shot in the side, and she is going to die. 
So um, I subsequently interviewed the missionary uh, and I said, why are you doing all these things? Why are you bringing Indians in from the jungle? So he said, well, we need their souls. So I said, have you converted any yet? So he said, no, none at all. I said, how long have you been here? So he said, two years. So um, I said, well, if they, are, if, they, if, they, if you bring them in and they die in your camp, what happens to their souls? So he said, well, they, they, they suffer eternal torment. He said, oh, I'm sorry, they suffer eternal torment. That is part of our doctrinal position, that uh, those who are not saved for the Lord uh, suffer the, uh, the pangs of hell uh, indefinitely. So I said, well, why don't you convert these people? So he said, well, unfortunately, I can't speak the language. So I said, well, this is an extraordinary state of affairs. The people who have been brought in here and who have died since they've been brought in are to die and they're to go to, to roast in the flames of hell forever just because you're a bad linguist. Now, I have this particular fascination for Indians. I mean, I, I find that uh, primitive people, so-called, are, to me, very attractive in other parts of the world, as, for example, as I saw them in Vietnam. But Indians in particular, I find very attractive. Because I find them... I, I like their gentleness, above all. I like the fact that they are not a cruel people. They are a kind, they're a sharing people, they are humorous people, too. And uh, they are very much my ideal of a human being. October the 24th, the thunderbolt has fallen. Today I was ordered to prepare to leave immediately for Taranto to embark on the Reina del Pacifico for Port Said. There will be no time for a last coffee substitute in the Grand Café in the Galleria to say goodbye and good luck to several girls who are virtually fixtures of the place and bear me no ill will because I was unable to help them marry Allied personnel. I do my packing in the bedroom, trying as I do so to imprint on my memory all the details of the piazza. There won't be even a half hour to spare for a dash up to the Vomero for a last panoramic view across the gardens of the Villa Floridiana, of the great grey and red city spread below, presenting at this distance a totally fallacious aspect of dignified calm or for a final contemplation of the somnolent Vesuvius, so changed in outline since its reshaping by the eruption. I went into the office to gather my papers together and write the day's report, realizing with sorrow how many projects had been started, but will now never be completed. On BBC One now, there's international snooker from Wembley, accepting viewers in Scotland who will be joining slightly later at 11.20. Now on BBC Two, it's time for Newsnight. Good evening. I guess we all knew, said former astronaut Senator John Glenn tonight, I guess we all knew there would be a moment like this. 
In the worst disaster in manned spaceflight, America's shuttle has exploded and the seven crew are presumed dead. We'll be examining in detail how the tragedy occurred just a minute into the 25th shuttle flight and asking the question, can the embattled shuttle program survive a disaster like this? And from Washington, I'll be reporting on the future of the American space program after its worst disaster ever. There'll be reaction from the Kennedy Space Center and from the president himself in a speech delivered tonight from the Oval Office. The crew of the space shuttle Challenger honored us for the manner in which they lived their lives. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of Earth to touch the face of God. The Electricians' Union tonight comes a step closer to expulsion from the TUC. The TUC appeals to its members not to cross printers' picket lines, with a full report on today's moves in the fight between Fleet Street and Wapping. All that plus a roundup of today's main news from home and abroad. In the whole short history of manned spaceflight up to this morning, 25 years of it, just seven astronauts, American and Russian, had died. Today, that number was doubled in one shocking split second at Cape Canaveral. The shock was all the greater for the way it came at the beginning of what looked like just another routine flight of the space shuttle. It was a brisk, clear day at the Cape, and millions of American television viewers watched live what has now become a commonplace event until just over a minute after the launch of the Challenger, one of America's four shuttles, this happened. The goal for auto sequence starts. 